uh, thank you very much for a lovely introduction. And uh, Paul, uh, Nicholas and Sharon and, the, and the, uh, the Rising Stars team, thank you very much once again for the very kind introduction and uh, an invitation to speak here again. Uh, I was having a mild panic yesterday morning when uh, Grady opened up with her presentation uh, and did a fantastic job. Grady's about this much taller than me and I could see her making this podium look normal sized. So I think they've snuck in during the night and put back in the short geologist podium, <laughs> which is lucky because I wouldn't be able to see you otherwise. Uh, what have we got up there? Righto, you're seeing what I'm seeing. Uh, I've changed out the, uh, the photo behind our logo this year and uh, part, part of the reason was is it's, it's a little bit of a theme. Um, the textures in those rocks, uh, which is in quartz veins, the extent of the quartz veins and the alteration which, uh, pattern which surrounds those quartz veins is causing a reasonable amount of excitement for a, uh, a small unlisted company. Um, they occur above the intersection of two very large scale crustal lineaments, um, which is, I know, a little bit of techno mumbo jumbo. It's a bit, bit full on for 8.40 in the morning. Um, these, where these lineaments intersect, you do find monster ore deposits in some parts of Australia, and the largest ore deposits in Australia all have this commonality. I don't know exactly what the causal link uh, is, but suffice to say, where you've got a big breakage in the crust, you often find interesting things above. This area has been completely unexplored. So, interesting story. I'm not promoting it to you. It's an unlisted company. Uh, we own a large part of it. And it has been one of the earliest victims of the liquidity crunch, which is something I'm going to be talking about in my talk today. So it's something that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years. We've watched very carefully, and the valuation has come down to a level where we were very happy to put some money in, feeling that the tremendous amount of upside, which is possibly not just 100 times, but 1,000 times, is not at all priced. You're not giving anything away for that. The downside is protected by the very low value that we could invest at. And that's all because they were struggling to raise money in a market which is struggling to back particularly early stage things. So let's hope that one pays off. But it's a great example because that is uh, very much a theme that runs through this talk today. This, this picture always makes me think, uh, I wish I'd closed the bloody car door before I took that picture. I can, I can give you advice about how to take pictures in the desert. I can't give you advice on investment, uh, so please treat what I'm talking about as for education purposes only. I want to start with uh, a couple of charts. This is the ASX 100 Resources Index uh, from 2021 till now, so it's about two and a half years. Um, reason for putting it up on this time scale uh, is if I had to explain this to a six-year-old, uh, what I'd just say is it zigzags across the page, it doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, and that's the point. Um, this has entered a phase having nigh on tripled uh, since 2016, where it's been going sideways. Now, this contains the biggest resources companies. Uh, so, you know, to some extent, they're the biggest, best protected. Um, and this index has not really grown over that time. You'll probably say, oh, that's a bit incorrect. It has edged up a bit. But depending where you start and finish it, uh, it has been more sideways than up or down. Add to that. Uh, this is the, all, uh, the ASX 100 industrial. So this is literally the rest of the Australian market. Despite being called the industrials, it contains the banks, the supermarkets, uh, the widget companies. You don't have to have a factory to be an industrial in this day and age. And uh, the industrials index um, has, has underperformed. In this period of time, uh, or particularly from uh, the point where you can see, there's, there's a reasonably clear peak in the, uh, the ASX 100 industrials index. November 2021, and that, that corresponds with the peak of most big uh, global equity indices. So, you know, if, you were, if you're thinking about what's happened in uh, global equities, the peak was 2021, late 21, and it's, and it's been down since. The resources stocks seem to have outperformed on that, particularly if you started both of those charts in November 2021, the miners or the resources companies have massively outperformed. And one of the points of interest I'd just like to draw your attention to on this slide then is the apparent rotation that we saw very late 21, very early 22. And of course, that corresponds with the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia, uh, where commodities got a spike, uh, the risk perceptions of a lot of people changed, and it's overlapped, probably contributed as well, uh, to the proliferation of inflation and uh, people's understanding and acceptance of that. So equity markets have, have responded to all that. One has appeared to benefit somewhat, one and uh, the rest uh, appear not to have. Um, before I move on from this, I would add, uh, it, I think it's an interesting observation because the last time we had financial upheaval in the global economy in 2007 and 8, 
we saw the mining stocks continue to outperform for a period of time, driven at that time by a sustained belief in the Chinese economic miracle, which, which didn't play out, uh, yet the resources stocks, supported by a belief in commodities, were one of the things which persevered well past the peaks of 2007. So I'll take off the industrials and I'll add uh, the ASX small resources. So this is the so-called small cap miners. Uh, most of them are fairly large companies in their own right, um, and they're certainly not micro caps. And in this period of time, you can see uh, a peak developing in the resources stocks. There's, there's far more companies in the small resources index than in the ASX 100 resources index. Uh, and in that period of time, they've, they've underperformed. So the peak, if you like, for the resources uh, sector was the 19th of April uh, 2022. I can't remember what day of the week it was. It was definitely between Monday and Friday. Um, it, 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 the, the reason I'm pulling it out is this becomes a reference point for just thinking about recent performances. And if I pull those apart and add some of those numbers, um, from that point, 19th of April, you, you've, you, you're, you're more or less breaking even. I mean, 5% down, it depends where you cut it. It might be a bit more than that if you add a week or so's data from when I cut these charts um, in the big stocks. There's an enormous performance gap which has opened up in that period of time in the small resources. Uh, so they're down almost 23%. Um, if you add the micro caps, and there is no index for this, so I have to draw you a picture instead. Uh, there's 664 companies listed on ASX which are classified as minerals and mining focused that sit below a market cap of $200 million. 87% of them have had a negative performance since that date in 2022. And the, uh, the bulk performance of that group is down just over 48, almost 50%. So there is a performance gap developing there as well. Uh, I'm going to come back to that towards the end because the liquidity uh, effect that, is, that has caused this to happen is, um, is quite visible, uh, particularly in some of the subsectors like gold. Now, I don't think anyone here is going to be guessing about what's caused this. Um, globally, equities have, uh, have come off. Some indices more than others. The S&P 500 uh, displays that reasonably well. Interest rates have jumped, uh, and this is all in response to the biggest spike in inflation since the 1980s. Um, what that brought about is a, uh, a fairly considerable degree of, uh, I suppose you'd say, deterioration of risk appetite. Um, and the way it gets described, I heard, in fact, uh, several speakers, including Grady, I think yesterday, using the expression, there's a lot of volatility around. Um, and I've heard that a lot recently as well. Volatility, if you look it up, you know, it has a definition. Uh, it's a noun. I don't know how many times I'm going to have to press the button here. There we go. Um, it's got a couple of definitions which come out of the dictionary, but I think the way it gets used in equity markets is just, it's a really gentle way of saying that your stocks aren't going up at the moment. In fact, they're going down. Uh, so I hear it, and that's what I, that's what I see. There's been so much economic priming uh, in the last just over a decade. Uh, I think, well, to this geologist anyway, and I'm not an economist, I'm, a, I'm just a geologist, right? So um, inflation has seemed like an inevitable outcome at some stage, and you can try and manage your way towards it, but people have been managing this for a very long time, and it still breaks out. Uh, and between risk management and you know, economic management, uh, there's a real bind which is approached here. Um, the global financial crisis brought about a real focus on uh, bank balance sheet risk. It brought it into sharp focus. Um, regulations were tightened, uh, and these, these banks were incentivised to hold really safe assets, treasuries. Um, and the, the, the appetite for AAA-rated uh, safe government debt surged. It, it had the opposite effect on yield, of course, because when there's a high demand for uh, government treasuries, uh, yields don't go up. Um, yields tend to go up when no one wants to lend to governments who are... Uh, going broke and, um, and can't pay their public servants. So the result, super safe bank balance sheets. What a relief, right? They're only sensitive to one single thing, and that is rate rises, and in particular, aggressive rate rises. So this, this brings about uh, you know, a really interesting and, and risky time in global markets. And then you get comments like this. So this quote, I think, was from a couple of weeks ago uh, by Martin um, from America. Uh, Current interest rate, you know, he's made this comment about the effect that interest rates have had on, on uh, the, the risk profile of bank balance sheets. You look this guy up, I mean, he, he has had a, a tremendously expensive education. And he comes up with this, and, and I read it as a geologist, and I just go, well, no shit. I mean, th thanks for your contribution there, mate, but uh, go back to whatever your day job is and, and stop commentary. It, I, I'll get off my horse. Moving on to fundamentals. Um, yeah, a lot of people say to me, miners look cheap, how's that going to play out? So a couple of fundamentals here, and these are two key ones. Since 2010, I'm plotting the dividend yield and the price, uh, price earnings ratio of, um, of the ASX 200 resources 
uh, index, index, index. So um, PE, tremendously low. In fact, at the moment, this index, the resources index, is the highest yielding and the lowest PE ratio of all of the ASX sectors. Now, that doesn't scream uh, pricing upside. Uh, it sounds like a low mileage Toyota Land Cruiser with a $20,000 price tag to me. Um, there's something that's amiss there, and uh, it makes you wonder why is it that, that money's not rotating into this sector? Shouldn't it be a, a great place to have its money? So I want to look at that in a minute, but I thought I'd just swing briefly onto uh, commodities, and, and in particular, copper. Um, particularly because copper's a great one. It reads, you know, the, the way the economy is going, and it plays out with a bit of a, a, an indication of that. But secondly, you can get price data going back to the 1970s, which makes it easy to put together a long-term chart. The first thing which jumps out at me from this is um, leading up to and going through the boom which we had in the noughties, copper performed magnificently. It performed magnificently during 2005 6 where it went up by multiples. At that point, there was wonderful fundamentals in place. But it reached a point uh, at a price, and then for the rest of, for the next five year period, ending in 2011, copper only peaked out within 5% of that first peak which it achieved in mid-2006. Now there was wonderful fundamentals for copper and all commodities in place at that time because of the Chinese economic miracle. So what I'm trying to point to is, at some stage, this linear correlation between fundamentals and price breaks down, uh, and I think you just need to consider that. Fundamentals don't always drive to a much, much higher price. Sometimes they can just keep it at a roof level where buyer pain kicks in and they can't afford to pay much more for it. We see a similar pattern. Um, in 2021-22, copper went through a very similar multiple uplift um, in its price and then hit a price which is not tremendously above the point which it hit uh, or departed in 2011. And I don't think that much has changed in terms of the price that buyers of copper can afford to pay for it um, to, to fast forward to um, by, by a decade to now. Uh, so I, I'm not trying to uh, question too much what the price is going to uplift to. What I'm, what I'm wondering is, can it actually push hard through a level, no matter what these fundamentals are? And you've got to remember that those fundamentals have existed for a very long time. The demand for copper doubles roughly every 25 years. This world is super proficient at consuming copper. So there is no doubt about the demand. It's just that this linear linkage between that demand and the price that the market is prepared to pay for it might break down at a level. Now we saw similar patterns pre-China, and I've put on the point there where China really got rubber to the road in terms of a buyer of commodities. Um, and, uh, and, and we saw similar roof levels which were achieved there. So clearly, this assertion that there's a, there's a non-linear relationship can break down and there can be a step change upwards in that price that perhaps the market is prepared to pay as a roof. Uh, but looking forward, do I feel that that's something which can detach? I mean, the fundamentals that we think of with copper now is both scarcity and electrification. They play exceptionally well to this commodity and many others. Um, I don't see that step up being able to take place during an area where we've had very heightened economic conditions and the outlook is for troubled economic conditions. I think you need to be coming off of a surging base uh, rather than stepping forward there. So my, my big conclusion from this uh, slide is that just be aware of fundamentals. They can be fantastic, but trend will trump fundamentals in many, many cases. Um, I could have overlaid uh, on that copper price um, uh, an, indices of, uh, an index of miners, and, and this is the ASX 200 resources index. Um, and wanting to just have a comparison of, of performance and, and to think about why it is that miners haven't performed, even with that great fundamental in place. One thing that might have jumped off of this if I still had the copper price laid on it was when copper performed strongly in 2005-06, the miners did, and then they continued to perform strongly where uh, the market was buying that fundamental even if the copper price wasn't playing out to higher levels. I don't think that is being paid for in the current cycle. So uh, this, this chart would have shown that. But what I really want to do is to compare this to an, a, a, an asset sector uh, which has seen a lot of investor interest. And I've, I've really got to squash that down to lay on the NASDAQ, which is a, a tech theme, if you like, from the base of the GFC onwards is where they're overlaying. Um, the mining indice, uh, index is up, uh, I think, three times since 2016. It's only up 65% from its GFC lows. Um, yet the NASDAQ has performed up to 11 times multiple from the base of the GSC to the end of 2021. So there's a lot of money poured into that sector. And a lot of you would say, well, uh, you know, that's got an exceptionally high PE, shouldn't the money be coming out of it? Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, but I think in a lot of cases you've just got to fall back on. Investors think that performance indicates there's going to be performance. So 
perhaps the miners are having their lunch eaten, or in this case, you know, miners have drunk the Kool-Aid before, the investment market has dr dr drunk the Kool-Aid for miners before, so perhaps they're just having their Kool-Aid drunk by, uh, by someone else at the moment. Um, to round that one off, uh, I just wanted to show some comparative market caps uh, of, of the two sectors. The biggest uh, companies in tech uh, add up to a collective market cap of almost $8 billion, and that's with a 30% decline in their market. Uh, you compare that to the five biggest miners, and they add up to, whoops, said Daisy, they add up to just under 13% of the collective value of those five biggest tech companies. So if you're a really big money manager, it's like, where do I put my money? Well, I put it in the big companies, which has just kept getting bigger, I think is possibly the conclusion. Um, the fundamentals are, those two groups of companies have paid almost the same amount of dividends in 2022. So no, it doesn't make sense. Um, but the fact is, the money has stayed in one place, and in the hallowed halls where they make those decisions, I would say the important voices are saying, let's just leave it in tech for now and see what happens. There's a lot of M&A around in mining at the moment, drives a lot of speculation, quite exciting. Uh, it, rather than going into the details of what I see and, and the themes that fall out, because there are many, and this could be a presentation all on its own, what it reminds me of is the volume and the uh, rhythmicity of the M&A deals which are being announced and, and speculated about reminds me very much of 2007, 2008. A very, very heady market where growth was on the mind of the big companies and, and wanting to grow for relevance sake in some cases. Um, I would say that the market metrics which are being paid are much more sensible. So we're not seeing the miners misbehaving on their allocation of capital here, but they are definitely focused on getting bigger. And that is one thing which tells you that, uh, that the market is quite hot. And when the market's hot, you've got to worry about what happens next. I talk about liquidity a lot. The best, the absolute best indicator of liquidity uh, is how much, uh, how regularly the market is prepared to pay up for new companies which it doesn't understand and is doing risky things. The number of explorers listing every year on ASX. 2021 was uh, an almost record year for that. 2022, it fell off a lot. In 2023, it is really struggling. So this is the first indication that liquidity has fallen away and the market's not prepared to pay for risky things, particularly in our sector. Um, the final example I'd give of that is, that's the performance, uh, I think, for five years, uh, no, less than that, since 2020, of the ASX Gold Index, the gold miners in Australia, if you like. I'd add to that a subset of gold explorers. And the thing which jumps off the page there is, in 2023, the explorers have been absolutely left behind. And I can't explain that in any other way than when gold goes up, the miners go up, but in this case, the explorers haven't. So that leverage effect has absolutely departed them. And the reason for that is the market is just not prepared to pay for that risk anymore. The conclusions here are very, very simple. Um, no one knows how inflation is going to pay out. The equity market is overhung by that uncertainty and liquidity is drying up. It hurts the micro caps the most. That's across the market. There's more micro caps in our sector than they are in any other. Everybody's been asking me about this. Uh, this time last year, it was 11 o'clock. When liquidity dries up, folks, the cycle turns over. Uh, so this brings us to the top of the cycle. And what I'm watching for now, I'm already observing uh, in the small cap sector, in the micro cap, the explorers. Yes, this is definitely an opportunity, but I should correct that by saying this is becoming an opportunity because I think this is a trend in motion. It's not an opportunity just yet, I'm watching. Although we are investing in a couple of things which have been hard bitten. I'm gonna finish up with my last minute and 37 seconds uh, and just talk a little bit about what I do at Lion. Uh, I've never done this before. Um, I've tended to stay away from the, the hard sell, if you like, but there's been that many people in this audience who've asked me about Lion and how it's going. I thought I'd better give it a mention. Um, and I know there's a few shareholders in this room as well. So shout out to you. Please find me at the end if you'd like to have a bit more of a chat. Um, Lion has always been very driven by the cycle. This is what I've always spoken about in front of this audience. So we try to buy early and sell low. Uh, buy early and sell high. At the end of the cycle. That was, that was a pretty shit thing to say, wasn't it? Um, in the last two years, we've made th two or three very large exits. That's cashed us up. Um, and our key asset now is cash. Um, we, uh, we have that cash. It's not, it's not uh, eroding. It's, it's accumulating at roughly 4% per annum. And as I watch the, the, uh, the sector falling away in price, the, the target investments that we make in the junior miners and explorers, the purchasing power of that cash is, imp is improving, in fact it's multiplying. I think it's probably the only place in the world where the purchasing power of cash is, is improving is where you're prepared to invest in, in junior things like this. If you want to buy cartons of milk, your purchasing power is eroding, but we're the opposite in this case. Um, 
And uh, it, so Lion, uh, you, can, you can purchase it for uh, around about the cost of, of the cash which is in the vehicle. It's primed and ready. Uh, and in a market where being a liquid and not able to follow your investments, uh, even though you might very well believe in them, the dilution is what is really going to hurt you over the next period of time. That is a tremendous risk to investors. Um, Lion is sitting there uh, watching and waiting to take full advantage of that. And uh, I'm very happy to speak about that with people, but my time's up and it's flashing. So uh, at that, I'll leave it. Uh, thank you once again, and I look forward to talking to you um, through the rest of the conference, and I hope you enjoy the rest of it.